And um, Sipasisu, will you check whether there's anybody in the lo lobby? Um, Yeah, I'm um, keeping my eye on the lobby. There is no one right now. Yeah. All right. Um, it's, I am Fanula Dowling, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Robin Pickering. She is an isotope geochemist with uh, leanings towards paleoanthropology and archaeology. Her research seeks to understand where, and most importantly, when, our early human ancestors evolved and what their environments were like. And to this end, she has spent the last decade developing the U-series technique to date carbonates associated with early human fossils. Part of her job at UCT is to set up the country's first U-series dating laboratory, hence the title of your talk, Robin. Thank you so much and welcome. All right, thank you very much for the introduction and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for um, yeah, um, coming along to this virtual talk um, this afternoon. And what I would like to do is to talk to you about actually drawing human family trees um, and how understanding the role of time is so important. And so my title, which is a bit jokey of why dating cavemen is so important, um, this We'll look at this in general and kind of um, tie it into my own research as well. So I'm in the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Cape Town, and I'm also the director of the Human Evolution Research Institute um, at UCT. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, is it, does it not move on? No, not from my side. Uh, um. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, now we're in business. Um, so this question, where do we come from? This is a fundamental question that fascinates us as human beings. And the answer to this question really depends on the time scale we look at. So you can see there's a very sweet picture of a very chubby little baby me with my mum. And so this is a kind of obvious answer to where do we come from if we look on a time scale of our own lives. Then in the middle panel, you can see if we zoom back out in time into tens of hundreds of years, we can answer this question with um, our own family trees and our own um, memories of grandparents. And um, we can, you know, at, this is within living memory. And if we dial back into thousands of years, we have the um, material remains of ancient civilizations. But what happens? happens if we go back millions of years and it's this delving back into the millions of years of time which is what we're going to do in this talk so can I have the next slide so what I would like to do this afternoon is we're going to talk about this human family tree and um, the concept of showing the evolutionary relationships between us and our extinct fossil ancestors and we can trace back the idea of doing this to Charles Darwin then we're going to take a moment to look at the components of these trees and the difference between a relative and an ancestor. Then we're going to look specifically at the ancient fossil um, components or the kind of characters that make up the family tree and where we find these ancient hominins. And um, we're going to specifically look at the South African record and I'll bring in some of my own research in um, dating cavemen, finding out how old they are and why this is important. Then we're going to look at um, going back to how we draw the trees and understanding where we find hominins both in time and space from a theoretical point of view versus what we actually find. So we're going to do a little bit of a thought experiment. Um, and then we're going to bring all this back together and kind of critically assess the human family tree. And is this actually a useful way to think about human evolution? Then I'd like to round off because the context for any kind of research is always important. And for us in South Africa, um, human evolution um, needs to be now re-examined through a lens of decolonization. So we're going to have a little look at this. 
And then it's impossible to cover a, a diverse and huge and interesting fields like this in kind of 45 minutes. So I've got some tips at the end for some further reading or watching for you. So that's that's the aim of what we're going to do. Next slide, please. So this is a rather out of date kind of cartoonish version of a human timeline, but it's useful for us today because what we see on the left of your screen at around six million years ago, this is where we have a split and we have between the um, kind of family trees of modern extinct great apes like gorillas and chimpanzees, and we last shared a common ancestor with them around six million years ago. And then between kind of four million years to the present, we find extinct early humans and we find the fossils of these creatures and they're collectively known as hominins. And between four and two million years, the dominant group of hominins, the dominant genus are the Australopithecines. We're going to talk a little bit about those. Um, we find wonderful fossils of Australopithecus in South Africa. Then around two million years, we see the beginning of our own genus, Homo. And again, we have important evidence for this in South Africa. And then eventually we end up kind of in the modern day with us as Homo sapiens. So next slide, please. So this um, idea of drawing a tree of life, we can trace this concept back to Charles Darwin. And on the left is a photograph of one of the pages out of his notebooks, a notebook of his. And this um, page was written in 1837. And um, you can see he's drawing this kind of rudimentary tree, trying to show the evolutionary relationships between um, different organisms. And what's inherent in this kind of drawing is that there's a time depth. So the structure is important. We start at the bottom with a trunk and we get this branching out into kind of major branches and then smaller branches and twigs. Um, and as that is happening, things are becoming more distantly related to each other and you get a diversification. You're getting more and more different ki kinds of organisms, which is called speciation. We're getting more and more diversity from a single shared origin. Um, what I find really, and this is the first time in any kind of scientific discourse that we see this way of showing evolutionary relationships. And what I think is really charming is at the top of his notebook, he's written, I think. So it's very typical of Charles Darwin that he was quite reticent. Um, and he this was in 1837 and then it was much later in 1859 that he published his kind of seminal book, The Origin of Species, in which he suggests that um, modern humans share a common ancestor with apes. So that doesn't mean that we and he was really um, kind of mauled in the press and you can see there's a cartoon of his head on a kind of ape-like body and he wasn't saying that we evolved from monkeys it's a big distinction to say that we shared a common primate ancestor with modern living apes um and then in his long illustrious career by 1871 he wrote another book called the descent of man where he predicted that the oldest human ancestors would be found in africa so next slide please so this is another way of, so this is the first go we're going to have at looking at our hominin family tree. And so you can see what we're doing here is we've got time. So on the left hand side, you can see in rather small text um, things like neogene, quaternary, Pleistocene, and Pliocene, Pleistocene, and these are divisions of the geological time scale. So um, we're starting at about six million years at the bottom of this diagram. And um, the different hominin fossils are all plotted onto this and the bars that are kind of orange or in some cases blue, that's showing the distribution in time that we find these fossils. And um, they, so they plotted against time and there's more branches the higher up we go. So the basic concept is very similar to that little Darwin sketch that we have this shared ancient origin. Um, that goes into the depths of time around six million years is where we commonly start. Um, and then we get the more and more comp complexity as we go through time, more and more branches appear. The way that this hominin family tree is drawn is that it's pretty linear. Those black lines between the different um, fossil occurrences are um, implied lines of descent so that we get one type of creature that's then evolves and is replaced by the next one. And we have this kind of linear stepwise um, evolutionary 
um, kind of change through time. And in this diagram, there's more or less only one species around at a time. So this is the kind of classic common and family tree that I was taught as an undergraduate. Um, and the, we're going to look at whether this is still true and whether this is the best way to do it. Um, and but the big questions are still relevant. So the big questions are how are these species related to each other? And in fossils this old, it's impossible to extract something like ancient DNA. So we can't actually tell biologically how these fossils are related to each other. We have to look at the morphology of their teeth and skulls, which are the most common parts that we find and try and figure out how they're related to each other. But then it's also important to work out how they're related in both time. So how they change over time and, and in space. So all the earliest um, human fossils are found in Africa. Um, but who was related to whom is the major question um, which we're trying to answer by showing the data in this way. Could I have the next slide, please? So it's important to take a moment here to pause and define two important concepts with family trees. So the one is an ancestor and the one is a relative. And if we really think about what these two words mean, an ancestor is a person from whom one is descended. So there's um, an inherent implication of time depth here, and it's a direct line of descent. That's very important that this is the direct line of descent. So a relative, on the other hand, is someone who is you are connected to by blood or by marriage. Um, and if from a kind of hominin point of view, this is a species related to another by a common origin, but does not have this direct line of descent. So if you can just click next for me, please. So <laughs> this, this is my daughter, Lucy, um, when she was little and she's now a very sassy seven year old. But I'm going to use Lucy. We're going to look at Lucy's family tree and we're going to look at two. We're going to crack open the family album and look at two examples to try and show the difference between the importance of ancestors and relatives. And with this information, we're going to go back to the hominin family tree. So can I have the next slide, please? So um, Lucy's father's family are, um, live in New Zealand. And this photo was taken on a family trip back to New Zealand with baby Lucy to meet her grandparents. So if you can click next for me, please. There's Madam Lucy. And if you click again, there's Lucy's parents. And another click will show you her grandparents. That's my, um, her father's parents. And another click is Lucy's great grandmother. Um, and then another click, please, will give you Lucy's uncle and her great uncle. And so in this picture, if we're talking about Lucy's family tree, there's a lot of her ancestors and this direct line of descent. So you've got Lucy, you've got her parents, her grandparents and her great grandparent, and then two uncles. If you can click again for me. If we took, so Uncle Ian and Uncle Tyron are lovely guys and they certainly um, add to the richness of Lucy's family life. But if we took them out the picture in terms of a direct line of descent, this would make no difference to Lucy. Um, and while if we took anyone else out of this picture, um, there would be no Lucy, basically. You break that direct line of descent. And so in this picture, there are a lot more ancestors than relatives. And I want you to remember this. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is a wedding photograph. So if you can give me one click, there's Lucy's parents and grandparents, and then another click. And um, all these other people in this photograph are relatives. So they're uncles and aunts and spouses and cousins. And again, they add to the richness of Lucy's life, but they do not contribute to that direct line of descent. So in this photograph, there's a lot more relatives than ancestors. So if we can go to the next slide, if we look at this, this is a more accurate way of looking at a human family tree. So it's all the same components from that old linear version that we started off with. So on the left hand side of the screen, we're starting here at about seven million years. And if you look across the screen until the right, um, we get to zero, which is the modern day. And all the different hominin species, you can see examples of the skulls and their names. And they're all given the um, the bars below them represent the amount of time in which we find these fossils. And you can see the bars are greyed out on either side because these so-called first and last appearance dates actually have errors associated with them. And we're never completely sure on just the first time that we find a fossil, 
doesn't mean that that's the first time that that species actually appeared. They were probably running around quite a long time before that and before we find their fossils. And in this family tree, you'll notice that there's no lines of descent. They're not linked together. We're not making any implications about who we think is related to who. And the way they are organized um, from bottom to top in this diagram is by brain size. So there is an organization that modern humans plot up towards the top right hand corner because we have much larger brains. Um, so if you can give me a click, please. So these are the two examples where we have the family reunion where there were a lot more ancestors and the wedding photograph where there's a lot more relatives. So if we look at our human family tree and what's going on with all these hominins, are we looking, are they all ancestors? Are they our direct ancestors? Or, or are we looking at a case where there are many relatives, aunties, uncles, cousins, and these direct lines of descent are much more muddled and complicated than we've previously thought? So the um, it's very difficult to do this for the old part of the hominin family tree. But in the more recent past, so the last kind of 50,000 years, um, this becomes a lot easier because we can extract ancient DNA from the fossils. And what we see in the research on early modern humans and Neanderthals is that there is actually a huge amount of interbreeding and kind of in intermingling. And instead of a kind of straight pathway of evolution, we have a much more complex picture. So I'll come back to this briefly at the end of the lecture and direct you if you would like to know more about this kind of later end of human evolution. But my work focuses much more on the earlier stuff. So can I have the next slide, please? So before we can work out who's related to who and have these kind of philosophical debates about how we should um, construct these family trees, we actually have to find the fossils first. So Africa is the home of human evolution and all the oldest fossil remains ever found are in Africa. So this map shows the yellow stars, shows some of the major places where we find early human fossils in, um, on the edge of the Sahel in Chad. And then all the way down from Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, and um, down the East African Rift Valley. And in the top photo, there's the famous Kenyan couple, Mary and Louis Leakey, who excavated at Olduvai Gorge. And then the lower panel shows Zarai um, Alemgesed, who's a famous Ethiopian archaeologist, showing the very sweet baby fossil that he, him and his team had found. And... Um, the advantage, one of the other, so you've got to find the fossils and we've got to work out how old they are, because if we want, when you find a new fossil, you need to be able to fit it into what we already know and needs to take its place in this kind of human family tree. And to do that, we need to know how old it is. So in Eastern Africa, in the Rift Valley setting, there are a lot of volcanoes. If you think about Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Kenya, these are active volcanoes today. And we have evidence that they were active way back millions of years ago, and there were many other active volcanoes as well. And so if you look, you can see Mary and Lewis excavating and behind them, there's a wall of sediment and you can see dark brown um, layers. And those are mud layers from ancient lake deposits. And in between those are kind of light gray, chalky layers. And those are ancient volcanic um, tuff. So it's the material that gets blown out of volcanoes, which and as you can see, it looks like a sandwich. So we've got these layers. And the fossils and archaeology are found in the lake deposits and those um, volcanic beds we can actually date. We can pick out individual crystals which formed inside the volcano and date those. So you can work out very easily exactly how old the fossils are in Eastern Africa. And there's been a huge amount of research done on this. Next slide, please. Um, so the other place that we find early human fossils is in South Africa. And here's a picture of Professor Lee Berger with his latest find of Homo naledi. And the richest, the single richest location for early human fossils anywhere in the world is the Cradle of Humankind, just north of Johannesburg. And so we know that the landscape we see today in the cradle has had about 30 kilometers of surface erosion. So when the hominids were running around two million years ago, there was 30 meters more sediment. So the caves in the Cradle of Humankind today are rather disappointing little holes in the ground. And um, you have to imagine the landscape with 30 meters of sediment removed. 
So the bottom panel is a photograph of um, Stokefontein Caves, the deposits where the hominins are from. And it's it's a bit underwhelming. It doesn't really look like a cave anymore. So in order to understand the actual cave geology, which is what I've which is what my work has been on, um, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, it helps to look at um, active modern caves. And this is a, a very young, very smiley, very dirty picture of me in the Narracourt Caves in Australia. And what I'm so excited to see is there's major components of cave deposits. So dripping down from the roof of the cave, you get stalactites. Then growing up from the floor of the cave, you get stalagmites. And then the wet, dark colored layer on the floor of the cave kind of flowing out towards my shoes. This is called a flowstone. And this is where the calcium carbonate, which is the same material as the stalagmites and stalactites, actually flows along the cave of the floor, which is at the floor of the cave, which is why it's called a flowstone. So can I have the next slide, please? So what we can do, and this is my entire PhD reduced into a single slide. So um, in the cradle of humankind in South Africa, there are no volcanoes. And so for decades, and indeed when I was an undergraduate, I was taught that it was impossible to date the South African deposits because there were no volcanoes. There were none of these volcanic layers, so we can't date the cave deposits. But um, what we can actually date are these flowstones, these calcium carbonate cave deposits. And we can use a method called uranium lead dating. So uranium lead dating is analogous to carbon-14 or carbon dating, but instead of using carbon, we're using uranium. So uranium is radioactive in the same way that carbon is, but it has a much longer half-life than carbon-14, so we can date older things. And what we're actually dating is the formation of the carbonate. So um, on the slide, you can see the uranium decay chain. And then there's a photograph from taken from under a microscope. And what you can see, the kind of vaguely hexagonal shapes. These are individual calcite crystals. The scale bar is 100 microns. So this is really tiny. And those are the actual individual calcite crystals that grow as that flowstone layer forms on the bottom of the cave. And as each crystal grows, it locks in uranium. And that uranium begins on a um, crystal by crystal basis, begins to decay. And it's called in situ decay because it's um, as it's locked into those crystals. And then the daughter isotope from that decay is lead. And what we can do is we can measure um, the amount of uranium and the amount of lead. And we know the half life, how quickly the uranium decays. And so the only unknown then is um, how long it's been doing that for. And so we have wonderful lab. Um, laboratory machines that can measure these tiny amounts of uranium and lead, and we can solve the decay equations and date that um, layer of sample. And so the other photograph on the slide is a, a sample of one of these flowstone layers. Um, and you can see within that there's a centimeter scale, sub-centimeter layers of this calcite that grows slowly, slowly, slowly on the floor of the cave. And the yellow box is outlining. You can see where um, I have cut out little blocks of calcite. And I measured the uranium and the lead in these, and I was able to work out that that particular piece is two million years old. Um, if I can have the next slide, please. And what we can use this for is that, so this is um, an example from Stoke Fontaine Cave, um, also in the Cradle of Humankind. And on the left-hand side, what you're looking at is one of the walls of um, what used to be an underground part of the cave, but there's been all that erosion, remember? So we're just looking at a remnant wall of sediment. Um, and there's a person for scale up at the top. And along the bottom where the number six and seven are, you can see there's a white layer, and that is the a flowstone sitting at the bottom. Then there's a great big thick package of sediments, and that way, that's where we find the um, hominin fossils. And then where the number five is, that's a little patchy bit of flowstone at the top. And if you can click next for me. Um, I was able to date that bottom flowstone to 2.5 million and that top piece at 1.8. And so then we know rather like um, the, in Eastern Africa where we can date the ash beds, in South Africa we can date the flowstones and we can use this kind of sandwich relationship that if we know it's 2.5 at the bottom and 1.8 at the top, all the fossils we find in between must be between those ages. Um, and then on the slide you can see a little piece of flowstone that I took out of the laboratory um, took to the laboratory rather, the little pieces that I cut out. And then on the right hand side, um, these are the um, what, one of the constructs that I used to actually calculate the age. 
And if you can click next for me. Um, this is important because we find these things like hominin fossils. And um, these on this photograph, the little scale bar in the middle is one centimeter. So these are very small teeth. They are baby hominin teeth. And this is normally these four little teeth. My colleagues were so excited when they found these that we wrote a whole scientific article on four teeth. Um, and this is normally all that we find. So teeth are the hardest um, biological tissue in the body. And so they resist erosion and they're the most common fossils that we find. And um, that's normally all we find is teeth. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So it's a really big deal when something like this is found. So this is um, Australopithecus sediba, which was um, first published in 2010 by um, the discovery was led by um, Lee Berger. And you can see this remarkably beautiful skull on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side, um, the site of Malapa, also in the cradle of humankind, yielded two partial skeletons of early hominins. Um, and yeah, the, to find this many bones is really incredible and really rare. So can I have the next slide, please? Um, and so this big question was, how old is Sediba? So we found these wonderful fossils, but we really need to know how old they are. So this photograph is again showing you one of these walls of sediment in the remnant caves, and it's a bit underwhelming. It's not very impressive, um, but in between where we find the fossil hominids, we find other ancient animals, fossil bones as well. And um, if you can click next for me, please. We see we've got these ancient horse bones from the, which is the equus fossils. And we know that horses only appear in Africa at around 2.3 million years ago. And then at the top of the sequence, we have an ancient saber tooth cat called Dinophilus. And Dinophilus goes extinct at about 1.5 million. So the um, Sediba fossils must be between, say, around 2.3 and 1.5 million from the other animals that we find in the deposit. If you click next for me. Um, right underneath where they found the new fossils is this big, thick layer of flowstone. And on the right hand side of the slide, there's um, a little piece of that flowstone. And I had just finished my PhD. It was very good timing for me. Um, and I dated this piece of first stone to exactly two million years. And so that was um, in the ballpark of what we were expecting that um, given the fossil animals, but this layer is still lying underneath the fossil. So we need some other technique to try and kind of pin down this age range even more. If I can have the next slide. So to do this, we need to very quickly look at another dating um, method, and this relies on the paleomagnetic signals. So today, the Earth has a magnetic field, and today that magnetic field is aligned to the North Pole. So in the top part of this diagram, you can see the Earth's magnetic field lining up to the geographic North Pole, and this is called a normal um, magnetic field. But the magnetic field is not stable and it doesn't stay like this all the time. And it can completely flip over so that the Earth's magnetic field can be orientated around the South Pole. And so this is called a reversed field. And if you click next for me. Um, this happens repeatedly going back through time. And we have a very, very well dated and very well constrained idea of when these reversals have taken place. And so what this diagram is showing you, it's going from zero to four million years and the red bars where we have a normal field and the green ones are where that field is reversed. And so if I can have the next slide, please. Um, my colleague Andy Harries at La Trobe University in Johannesburg, I mean in Johannesburg, in um, Melbourne, in Australia, um, Andy is a specialist on doing paleomag um, analysis, particularly on cave deposits. So um, Andy and I had worked, have worked together for a long time and in the um, picture of Andy in a cave, he's a very keen caver. And in the middle panel, these are one of the blocks of sediments of flowstone that I was going to date. And you can see what Andy's done is he's orientated this block to the magnetic north today. And then in his laboratory, he measures the tiny little magnetic minerals in this ancient flowstone to see if they are pointing to the magnetic north or if they record a reversed signal. And if I could have the next slide, please. What Andy discovered is that um, at the site of Malapa, 
Um, so we've got the flowstone, which I dated to 2 million at the bottom. And then Andy has a series. He's got a normal signal, some reverse signals. And then where we find the fossils, that part of that sediment was um, had a normal signal again. And using what Andy could do is he could take my age and then we went to the known record of these reversed and normal um, with this kind of known barcode. And we were able to fit our signal into this known barcode using my uranium lead date to pin it. If you click next for me, the only place that we could accommodate this, there's this tiny little um, normal period in a long reversed at 1.977 million years ago. So our Australopithecus sedibo sediments, that block of sediment, had to have accumulated at 1.97 million years ago. So by using this combination of dating techniques, um, we were able to overcome this kind of massive problem with dating the South African deposits and give them ages and very precise ages at that. So next slide, please. So this, we can go back to this question of where does Australopithecus sediba fit in? So at around 2.2 million years ago, we have Australopithecus africanus, and we have a pretty good idea of what's going on with um, Australopithecines. Then um, there's a, there was a big gap in the hominin record with very few fossils from this time period. And then again, at around 1.6 million years, we have beautiful fossils of Homo agaster, which is the beginning of our own genus of Homo. But what was happening in between was basically completely unknown. If you click next for me, because we have the really precise date of Australopithecus sediba, we can pop this fossil in here. And um, we argue that Australopithecus sediba is the most, it's the best candidate to be an ancestor for the genus of Homo. So it's likely that Australopithecus sediba is one of our direct ancestors and that our entire genus of Homo evolved from um, something like Australopithecus sediba. So again, this is making the point of trying to understand how these fossils are related to, to each other and the importance of knowing how old they are. So can I have the next slide, please? So what I would like to do for the next few slides is um, to take you on a kind of thought experiment where we think about what we actually find um, what was actually what, what's actually observed and what was actually there. Um, and these slides were very generously um, provided to me by Professor Bernard Wood, and there's a picture of him on the slide. So Bernard Wood is probably the most preeminent paleoanthropologist in the world, and he is an expert on hominid taxonomy. So this question of who's related to who, how do we sort out ancestors and relatives, literally no one in the world has thought about this more than Bernard Wood. Um, and in the end, at the end of my talk, I'm going to direct you to another presentation of his, if you're curious to hear more about um, you know, his work. But um, what I want to do is take you through a couple of these slides of his. Um, and what we're looking at in this slide is um, on the X axis, no, sorry, on the Y axis, we're looking at time. So this is the same as all the diagrams I've showed you that we're looking from going from older through into younger on the Y axis. Then on the X axis, what Bernard's looking at in this diagram is space. So where we find these hominins. So we find hominins in Eastern Africa and South Africa. And just because we don't find a lot of fossils in between doesn't mean that the hominins weren't actually living there. And so what he's drawn on this diagram is the likely distribution of hominins through time and space. Um, and this is probably what it looked like. So this is one species and the different gray dots are kind of representing individuals or individual populations. You get bigger ones and smaller ones, but all together they are enough to be clumped together into a single species. And this is, I want you to imagine that this is what this ancient species actually looked like um, during its um, for as long as we find it. Then if you can click next for me. So imagine then a whole lot of paleoanthropologists come along and we find a site, say in Ethiopia, and um, we find two of these fossils. So we find two individuals and um, we've got a, so it's a pretty restricted spatial um, area that we found them in. 
and um, we find them over quite a, a reasonably long time period. And these two are both quite big and they look the same. So we've got, we reckon now we have a pretty good understanding about what the species looks like. But if you can click next for me. Then we find another site and it's further away. So the spatial distribution has got bigger. And um, these two individuals look a little bit bigger. They're a little bit different. But more, are they the same species? Yes, we're pretty confident about that. The site's a little bit older, so that increases our temporal resolution, but we're still confident that it's the same species. You can click next for me. Then we find another site that again is further away. It's only one individual, but it's pretty much the same size and it's within the same time range, but it's increasing the spatial resolution. But we still find that's definitely the same species. No problem. Next, please. Then what happens if we find a site, say, all the way in South Africa? So this is a long distance away, so the spatial resolution is much bigger. And here we find big individuals and some really small ones. But it's the same time period as the other sites. And um, we've got some big, we've got some small. So what's going on here? Are these all the same species as each other? Are they the same as the other ones? And how do we begin to unpick this? And um, what we have the advantage of in this kind of thought experiment is we can see the full um, variation that existed in a single species. But you have to imagine as paleoanthropologists just finding these individual um, kind of isolated fossils, how that um, can be quite misleading. So can I have the next slide, please? So if we then accept that all of these are the same species, if we accept the um, last site into the same, then we've got this kind of wide um, temporal um, distribution of them and um, they've got a new range in space, but they we, they still appear more or less, appear and disappear more or less at the same time. So what I'm trying to, the argument I'm trying to make in this is that um, what we find as fossils versus what was probably there running around, there's a big distance between those two. And so, um, what to what Professor Wood says when he talks about this thing is when he tries to answer these questions, he says some things are just unknowable and exactly who was related to who in these ancient fossils, which we can't extract DNA out of, is something um, that future researchers, a challenge for future researchers, but may be kind of unknowable. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, this is a 2020 human family tree. So again, this is um, as this is something that Bernard Wood is famous for, is that um, him and various students of his compile all the known fossils and kind of update the best versions of the human family tree. So if you can look again on the y-axis, they take it all the way back to eight million years, and then they've color coded the, so that's the time distributions by the colored blocks. Um, and they've got possible early hominins, archaic hominins, transitional hominins, pre-modern homo, and then anatomically modern homo. So this is probably, in terms of organizing the fossils, the most up-to-date and best way of doing this. But this doesn't really answer our questions of where we come from and who of these ancient hominids was contributing to um, us as modern humans, who are our ancestors and who are our relatives. So I can have the next slide, please. So this is um, an important caveat that Professor Wood makes, that each one of these columns represents a hypothesis about the existence of this taxon. So a taxon is an ancient um, fossil and the ages existing at the site where we find that. So it's a useful way of thinking about um, drawing these bars that they're actually hypotheses that need further testing and we need to find more fossils and we need to constantly refine how well we can date those fossils rather than kind of locking it in that this is what we know. It's a more constructive way to think about it as a series of hypotheses explaining what we know so far. Next, please. And so perhaps this is actually how we should really draw our human family trees. So this is a completely different way to what I've shown you all along. Um, and so rather than, so this drawing, instead of going kind of up like a tree is flipped on its side, and it's meant to represent, um, instead of a kind of linear pathway, a braided river where you get um, channels, some move faster, some move slower, they move apart, they come together, you get mixing, you get branching. 
um, and that what's likely is that there was a lot more mixing and co-mingling mingling and sharing of DNA that ultimately produced us rather than this kind of single linear picture. And um, certainly the re research into, say, early modern humans and Neanderthals where we can extract DNA is showing exactly that. There's a, um, a huge amount of interbreeding was taking place. So next, please. So um, what I would like to end off doing, and this is just what I had said in the beginning, that research doesn't take place in a vacuum and the context is always important. And so if we look at the context of paleoanthropology in South Africa, um, this is a slide of kind of great South African paleoanthropologists. Um, and there's two things that all of these photos have in common, um, maybe three things. So they, they're all men, they're all white men, most of them are quite old white men, and they're all holding hominins. So that's a very, um, yeah, there's, it, it, there's this pattern basically of, and a very clear public image of who does paleoanthropology in South Africa. And um, only two of the men on this slide, Basil Cook and Philip Tobias, are actually South African. The rest are all foreign. So this is old foreign white men doing paleoanthropology, and they have controlled access to the fossils, funding, and the entire narrative of human evolution in South Africa has um, been done by a very narrow group of people. And we know that more diverse teams, you get better science, better ideas, um, and so paleoanthropology in South Africa really needs to be shaken up and needs a bit of transformation. So if I can have the next slide, please. So the Human Evolution Research Institute at UCT, um, this is our express um, goal. And um, Africa holds a rich record of this human evolution and South Africa has this incredibly rich record. But the investigation of this record has historically left out many voices. So our aim is to change this and to drive exceptional paleo sciences with diverse teams that are welcome, supported and dedicated to understanding, to uncovering the story of how and why we became human and telling our stories with many voices. Um, so if I can have the next slide, please. So our um, Human Evolution Institute has um, a, th a three tiered strategy to disrupt, transform and decolonize patriarchal narratives of human evolu evolution in South Africa. And so we have a number of postgraduate bursaries and 2020 was a year of enormous disruption. But we have two um, black female South African um, PhD candidates who have started their PhDs in different aspects of human evolution. Um, in 2019, we ran an undergraduate women only field camp because um, many um, people of color and women get put off paleoanthropology and human, human evolution in general by the negative experiences they have in the field. And um, there's a kind of rocks for jocks atmosphere on field trips, which is very, um, in, kind of has a massive atmosphere of exclusion and puts people off and we know this. So as a direct measure to counter this, we took the third year geology and archaeology um, undergraduate girls on a field camp to give them the skills which um, yeah, they may be lacking in the field and um, to give them a safe, informative and even fun experience of um, field work to with the express purpose of trying to retain them in the field of human evolution and even in research. And we discovered this, um, our field camp got a lot of attention. It was even covered, Nature, the um, scientific journal Nature sent, even sent one of their reporters to cover our field camp. And it was the first time anyone in the world had um, expressly done something like this as an attempt to bring around transformation in their discipline. So we obviously couldn't do this last year, but um, and we're not sure if this will be able to happen this year. But as soon as it's not too covid -y, we will obviously continue doing our field camps. And then the next slide, please. The other thing that we are busy with is a collaboration with the Iziko Museum in Cape Town, and we are putting together a new permanent exhibition on human evolution, which is called Humanity. And this is to bring to change this um, narrative of human evolution in South Africa, which is always told through the lens of white male discovery. So all those men holding fossils. And we want to we want to change this basically and 
we have uh, this new exhibition which is planned to open in 2022 which is targeted at six at eight to 16 year olds so school children and um, the idea is to bring pride in our incredible um, fossil heritage in South Africa and um, to inform people of our um, shared origins and to kind of retell this human evolution story. So if I can have the next slide, please. So in summary, um, we know that humans evolved in Africa and we find the earliest hominin remains um, all over Africa and some of the rich, the single richest place we find them is in South Africa. Constructing human family trees in this way that we've been trying to organize evolutionary relationships since the days of Darwin. We need to do this with caution and how we think about the roles of different taxa like relatives or ancestors and the age of the fossils is, are all very important considerations in constructing these family trees. Um, the South African fossils were long considered undateable and weren't really incorporated into the family tree because of this. Um, but by using uranium lead dating of carbonates, this technique has gone from being experimental to one we can apply routinely um, and we can get very precise ages for the South African fossils and they can kind of take their place um, in our human family tree because of this. Um, we also still have to be cautious about the fossils that we find versus what was actually there and the kind of um, caveat that what we find represented of the past is just a tiny sliver of what was there. And that perhaps a better way of thinking about human evolution rather than family trees at all is much more of a kind of braided stream. Um, and then, you know, human evolution in South Africa needs some shaking up and we're very excited to be doing this at UCT. I can have the next slide, please. Um, I thought you, in case you're interested and would like to some further reading or listening or watching, I highly, highly recommend a book called Darwin's Hunch by Krista Kuligen. So this is a book about the science um, and the, yeah, the science of humans, it's a kind of history of science of human evolution in South Africa. And what Krista has done is dug into the very kind of confronting and uncomfortable and racist history of um, human evolution in South Africa and how trying to classify people. I um, mean, we, yeah, this is, it's pretty confronting re reading, particularly for someone like me who works in this field, but it's a very readable and very well-written book. And if you're at all interested in human evolution in South Africa, I would say it is an absolute must read. Then if you're interested in the later parts of human evolution, and I've kind of hinted a little bit at um, what we, the incredible recent work that's been done on early modern humans and Neanderthals, um, a wonderful, also recent 2020 book by Rebecca, Rebecca Rag Sykes called Kindred is the most wonderful book about Neanderthals. Um, it's incredibly easy to read and understand and is geared towards a general audience. I highly recommend it. Um, and then the University of Liverpool has been running since the lock, great lockdown began. They've been running a really wonderful evolutionary anthropology webinar series. And all those webinars are record, um, kind of, they are free to view as YouTube recordings. So you can see a lovely interview with um, Rebecca about her book, Kindred. And there's um, another lovely talk by Bernard Wood talking about hominin taxonomy. And yeah, I highly recommend having a little browse through those titles if you are interested in human evolution. Have the next slide, please. So I have a very long list of acknowledgements, um, funding, organizations, university, um, and in bold at the top are my students. I would particularly like to thank all of them. And again, I'd particularly like to thank Bernard Wood for very generously letting me use his slides. Um, and next, please. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to listening for listening to me. Um, I hope you have some questions for me. I'm happy to stay online and I hope we can have a bit of a discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robin. Oh, what a wonderful presentation. Just, I love it. That distinction between relatives and, and ancestors is so clear now. <laughs> yeah, good. Thank you.
Have you done your daughter's family tree? Um, I haven't, but my mum did. My mum did as a retirement project. Um, and yeah, it's all very colonial, very 1820 <laughs> settlers. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating and wonderful. Um, and my mum got a, um, a calligrapher to, to beautifully draw it. So um, yeah, it's a lovely thing to have. Yeah. Um, if, if you want to ask a question, just unmute your microphone. I, I can't unmute your microphone for you, um, so you may not be heard otherwise. Let me see if there are any questions in the chat. Sterna, can we... Uh, it seems to me, Robin, that the what's so fascinating and changing all the time is is the dating methods. I mean, as your title suggests, um, that some of them must be of quite recent invention. Um, yes and no. Most of the, um, I mean. From my own experience, the method I use is actually quite old. It's been knocking around in some form, at least since the 1950s, but it was adapting it to be relevant to these sites. Um, so, yeah, and most scientific research is not great, exciting breakthroughs. It's like tiny incremental tweaks. So most of the theory of the methods has actually been around for a long time, but it's adapting it to be relevant to this particular setting. Um, and the other exciting thing is just finding new fossils, even in somewhere like the Cradle of Humankind, which has been under investigation since the, ninth, the late 1920s, um, and they're still finding new sites and new fossils. So, um, yeah, it's the kind of combination of techniques advancing and finding new material. Um, is a question from Robert. Um, Outside of Africa, where has the oldest fossil of this nature been found? So, um, thank you, Robert. The, um, yeah, the earliest, the oldest hominin fossils out of Africa are found in Georgia. So, um, yeah, kind of Eastern Europe. And they are about 1.5, 1.6 million. And they also belong to kind of Homo agaster. So the idea is that this was an early out of Africa movement. And by the time Australopithecines, it seems we only find those fossils in Africa. But when we get to our own genus Homo, it seems that these um, populations had the kind of capacity to survive in a broader range of latitudes. And so we begin to find their fossils very rapidly out of Africa. I hope that answers your question. I'm happy to discuss more if it doesn't. Um, um, Lindsay asks, how do you decide where to start a dig? Yeah, that's a great question, Lindsay. <laughs> um, so that's, again, like a combination of really high tech science and using satellite imagery and about where we know we find fossil sites. So kind of trying to characterize the sites we have and why we find them where we do and using that to build predictive models and using satellite imagery to try and map out where we would find other ones and then doing a lot of foot surveys like literally walking around looking for new fossils so there's a very high tech element and then there's a combined the very low tech um kind of instinct basically that um i am terrible at finding fossils i'm not i'm a rock person i'm terrible i, I literally don't i never find fossils but you get people who basically are just really brilliant at doing this and they have a kind of sixth sense and so it's definitely a combination of very high-tech exploration methods and a kind of spidey sense of let's dig here um, and i've certainly observed this in my colleagues there's a comment here that you're amazing <laughs> Um, is there a, a generosity about um, sharing digs and sharing research? You know, has Lee Berger got a monopoly on um, a particular area? Yes, so 
Yeah, paleo paleoanthropology is very, very political. And I think if we look at different at other aspects of scientific research, for, for example, the research ongoing research on say COVID-19, there's been unprecedented data sharing and people working together. Um, and historically, paleoanthropology is basically the complete opposite, where people are incredibly territorial. And um, unfortunately, one of the reasons that South Africa lagged so far behind in applying dating techniques and dating its fossils was because there was this very territorial um, kind of attitude towards um, this is my site, these are my fossils, I'm not going to collaborate with anybody. Um, so I, I really hope that this is changing in general, um, but no. So to give you a really honest answer, probably no. It's not a field known for its generosity. And these wonderful young black women who've, who are now making this their PhD topic, was it difficult to encourage them? I mean, did they voluntarily say, yes, this is a field that interested, or, or did you have to do some kind of proselytizing and <laughs> evangelizing? Not, not at all, not at all. So the um, there's lots, you all often see stuff about, you know, you know, you need to, it's a pipeline and we have to grow our own and we've got to encourage girls to be interested in science. And in my experience, this is absolutely not the case. The girls are there. They're super interested. They love it. Um, they are the our two um, PhD candidates are incredible. You know, they both got their masters with distinction. They're exceptional young scientists who are passionate about doing this. Um, but it's the field itself that it's not is not very welcoming and not very inclusive. And so the interest is there. The passion is there. Um, it was not difficult to recruit them at all. Um, our, the difficulty is going to be um, giving them a positive experience so that they actually want to stay in science and that they want to kind of take their place on the stage of being paleoanthropologists that they don't get put off along the way. Um, so no, it's not hard at all to find people who are interested. I think in general, South Africans are very interested in, in general in science um, and it's certainly, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't difficult to recruit people at all. And your first experience, I mean, did you, did you study it at UCT? Um, no, I, I grew up in Johannesburg, so I actually visited Stokefontein Caves. Oh. As a <laughs> I remember it vividly, it was wonderful. Um, and then I went to WITS. I mean, WITS is, has always been the kind of home of paleoanthropology in, the, in South Africa. Um, and I studied archaeology and geology. And yeah, I, ha I was given wonderful opportunities. I did my honors project on one of the sites in the cradle. Um, and I had a lot of really positive experiences. I also had a lot of really negative experiences. I got told that it was a waste of money to give postgraduate bursaries for women because they just have babies and leave the field. Um, and I was an honor student. Yeah, I experienced all sorts of harassment, sexual harassment, everything. Like, yeah, I've I have an entire catalog of bad experiences as well. Um, and I'm in no way unique. Every woman I know in science at my level has also a catalog of these unpleasant experiences. Um, I left South Africa, I did my PhD overseas, and then I did a postdoc in Australia. So I was out of South Africa for 10 years. Um, and it certainly helped to be a little bit more distant and not kind of embroiled in the local politics. Um, and yeah, I was very excited to come back to UCT and um, kind of bring the skills back that I had to leave the country for. And yeah, I'm very excited about what we're building at UCT as well. So. Well, it looks, it looks like a wonderful yeah, venture. So when was that established? The um... Yeah, so Professor Becky Ackerman started the institute. I think we got full institutional status in 2016. Um, and in 20, I think it was 2019 that we got um, a big five year funding block from UCT as part of the VC's hashtag advancing women initiative. So Harry was one of the runner ups in that initiative. So we've got five, a big fat five years funding from the university, which kind of changed the, the fates of the Institute having a budget to actually do things. So. Well, congratulations. 
Well, this has been absolutely marvellous and a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Robin, very much. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for the invitation and thank you everyone for um, yeah, listening to me ramble away this afternoon. <laughs> Um, CPC, uh, will you stop the recording or did I start it? No, you stop it. <laughs>